Okay, next I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, and that is, um, I know, I'm just standing up here, it's making me forget all my information. Katie Shumway, she is from Saranac Lake. She went to school at Paul Smith College studying biology, and the summer before she graduated, she interned with the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation in Saranac Lake. After that, she ended up working for them part-time during her senior year and took a job with them after graduation. She's now here as a research tech, and she will talk to us about their loon conservation and research that they're doing. Please welcome Katie Shumway. just going to be running through a summary of what our organization does and it is a lot so we're going to try to get through as much as we can. Um, if you have any questions feel free to raise your hand um, although I may answer by saying I'll get to it in a minute so just jump right into it. So the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation this is our uh, mission statement we're dedicated to promoting and inspiring passion for the conservation of common loons in New York State's Adirondack Park. Uh, we do that in a multitude of ways. We started off just strictly research. We only were focused on the loons in the area and our specific set team and over the past couple of years we've really expanded to focus more on education and outreach, doing speaks, um, presentations, and uh, really trying to get more information out there about the loons in the Adirondacks and more about our organization as well. So why study loons to begin with? What is good about them for studying? What do they tell us about the area? What's good to know about them? Um, for one, they're very high on the food chain. There isn't a whole lot out there that's really eating loons. Um, their chicks are susceptible to predation, but as far as the adults, they're kind of king of the hill up there. Um, so they're gonna be the ones who are the apex predator of their uh, food chain. They're also territorial. Um, mated pairs, territorial pairs, will guard one set lake, so that makes them good for research. We know who's on what lake, and it tends to stay that way just because of the territories that they set up. This is a loon who is throwing a temper tantrum, giving you an example of that territorial display. So this is likely a male, and he is doing what's called a penguin dance. It's displaying to all the other loons in the area, this is my spot, and if you come into my place, I am going to fight you. So he's showing off that big chest, trying to look really tough, and throw his beak down and look intimidating. Another reason why we study loons is because they're long-lived. Loons live 25 to 30 years, so that gives us a long time to keep looking at the same individual and seeing how are you changing throughout your lifetime, um, how are you accumulating toxins throughout your lifetime and what's changing in your environment? Um, so they're a good biological indicator for that reason. They're also just a species of special concern in New York. They're very well loved, as I'm sure a lot of you love loons almost as much as I do. Um, and they are a big symbol of the wilderness, probably just as much so as moose or bear in the Adirondacks. So just a quick rundown of some common loon natural history. There are five different species of loons in the world. The only ones that you're gonna see in the Adirondacks are the common loon, so that's that guy right there. Then we also have yellow-billed loons, Arctic and Pacific loons, and the red-throated. The only other one you might see in New York State would be the red-throated. Um, that's because their migration route passes through New York State. So anybody who's a really big birder, you might be good enough to get the right day at the right time, but if you're just passing through, chances are you're really only going to see the common. And all of these other species of loons are normally just distributed. Um, some are also found in areas of Europe, but for the most part, way up north in Canada is where you're going to find a lot of them. Loons are considered to be the feathered fish, so they have feet that are similarly structured to the same way that a frog has feet. Um, they're very streamlined and perfectly designed to be 
torpedoes underwater. There's not a whole lot that can outswim a loon underwater, so that makes them what great predators they are. And then as far as coloration, you can see the first hatchlings are going to be a nice black to dark brown color. Um, they'll molt uh, at three weeks to be a more brown, uh, lighter color, and then by nine, seven to nine weeks, they'll start getting their juvenile plumage. And they'll look a little ridiculous in between these stages. They are just sort of fuzzballs at this point. Um, and then the adult breeding, I'm sorry, excuse me, adult breeding plumage um, that most of you are familiar with, I'm sure, that black and white checkerboard pattern is what you're going to see on our loons during the summer. But in the winter time, they look a bit more gray and drab. They'll look a lot more like their juvenile plumage here. So I have a couple vocalizations to play for you. Loons have four major calls, the first one being a hoot. <laughs> So you probably only hear this if you were pretty close to them, either paddling or on the shoreline nearby them. A hoot call is a family call. It's one that they use to identify each other. So it's sort of like, stay with me, keep together, everybody stay, stay together, don't get lost. Um, and then the next one is a whale call, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with. So this is a loon's way of saying, I'm over here, where are you? How are things going at your place? <laughs> yeah, so the whale call um, is how adult loons communicate back and forth to each other. So sometimes you'll hear this late at night when you're camping. Um, it sounds very spooky. But it's really just loons saying, I'm over here, I'm doing well, how are you? And they're kind of doing like a nighttime roll call sure everything's all right, everyone's where they're supposed to be. Then the next is the tremolo. And the tremolo call is an alarm call. So that's a loon that's either in distress or has seen something that is making them nervous. So it's usually, ooh, watch out over there. Um, there's something that's bothering me or something that might be a threat to us. So pay attention to it, kind of pick your head up. And then the next one is a yodel call. This call only the males can make. So if you hear it, you know it's coming from the guys. And a yodel call is a very territorial call. I've been told from others that it's the equivalent of loon swearing. that's in distress. He's saying sort of that temper tantrum we saw in the beginning, stay out of my area, this is my spot, my spot. Um, and each male is going to have their own unique yodel call. So if you get good and familiar with the loons in your area, you might even be able to recognize, oh, that's the one from this pond, or that's the one from this lake, because they are different enough sometimes that you can even hear them just by ear. And then the last one I have here is a chick begging call. Um, the chicks stay with the parents throughout the whole summer into the fall before migration. And even when they're old enough to know how to catch their own fish and uh, take care of themselves pretty much on their own at that point, they tend to stay with their parents and continue to beg and mooch for food. So they hear this a lot. So what are some of the threats that are affecting loons in their habitats in the Adirondacks? The list is pretty long, and it changes from year to year, it seems, which threat is the highest. Um, so depending on what's going on in the area, um, and depending on what resources we have available to us, it seems that there are certain threats that are more important than others depending on the year. So the first I'm going to talk about, 
talk about is mercury, specifically methyl mercury, um, the toxic form once it's entered um, once it's entered the ecosystem. So the problem with mercury is that it bioaccumulates. So it starts off at small percentages with phytoplankton in the water and really it's not bothering those organisms. The issue becomes once those things are eaten by small fish and then small fish are eaten by larger fish and our loons are the ones eating all of those larger fish that have now accumulated a lot of this methylmercury. And the problem is even more so for male loons than females because the males don't have any way to get rid of these toxins once they've entered their system. Whereas the females lay eggs each year um, and as they're laying those eggs, they can get rid of a little bit of that toxin into the egg, and it may impact their offspring that year, but it is a way for the females to try and reduce that. It can impact adult behavior, so a bird that has really high mercury levels in their system is gonna be really lethargic and depressed. Um, they have uh, issues with their behavior. They don't react the way that they normally should to things. They don't protect their territory very well, and they don't take care of their chicks very well either. They just seem kind of out of it. And the chicks themselves are also very lethargic. They have issues getting up on their parents' back. They don't stick with their parents as well as they would without the um, higher levels of mercury. So one graph that we have here shows that once the levels get up to about 3, three to 3.5 um, for the mercury, that's sort of when we start to see issues with chicks fledged and um, a big drop in uh, their ability to take care of their chicks properly and um, get them to fledging. And we've also noticed that there seems to be a trend, the further east you go, the higher the mercury level or the higher the impact of mercury. So, for our Adirondack Mercury research, we have covered a pretty big area. Uh, we've been doing research with the mercury levels in loons since the early 90s when we originally started banding. Uh, once we started banding loons, we were able to also get feather samples and blood samples that we could send into lab and have analyzed. Um, and the good thing about having all of these banded birds is that we can continue to try and get that information from them year by year. So we have somewhere around 300 banded loons um, total now, up to date. And of those 300, we try to recapture as many as we can each year. Um, we're not recapturing 100% every year, but we are getting some information from those returning birds and seeing how those mercury levels have changed over time, if they're going down, if they're going up and what lakes those birds are on, so we can see which lakes are being most affected by this. So the way that we capture is very particular for loons. When you're capturing and banding them, it, all, it has to be at night. Uh, we go three people by boat, one person is in charge of light, one person is in charge of nets, and the third is in charge of calls, calling the loons in, and just sort of overseeing and growing the boat. So we'll use the night lighting technique, which is sort of like a deer in headlights technique. When we see the birds getting up close to the boat, you can use the spotlight to try and kind of make them freeze up so that you have enough time to scoop them before they can dive back down into the water. And the playback technique, uh, we'll play loon calls sort of similar to what I just played you. We'll play chick noises to drink, draw the parents up to the boat, and then once we get the adults in, it's usually pretty easy to get the chicks in. So all of the birds that we're banding are gonna get a nice bracelet with them. And I have a foot up here. I have a little foot to pass around for you all. It's not a real foot, it is wooden, uh, but these are the bracelets that were on a bird at one point. So the color band um, can tell you which individual you're looking at. The color code is just for each individual. So we've run out of color combinations and we're now using black dot and white stripe and all sorts of different things to try and tell individuals apart. And while you're passing that loon foot around, definitely take note. Um, it's very thin and cuts the, their foot will cut through water like a knife. 
So it really does look odd. It's not rounded or dowled like you'd expect a bird's foot to be. It's very flat. And that is an accurate size representation of what their foot would be, so pretty big. So we're also doing blood samples and feather samples, and we're partnering with veterinarian clinics in the area to be able to get information back on that. Uh, and we're usually just looking at mercury level. That tends to be what our um, biggest thing that we're trying to keep, in, keep tabs on is, but we're also scanning for other Toxins. Each bird that we're banding is also going to be given a health assessment, make sure that everything's looking good and that they're not having any issues. And then we also do monitoring of reproductive success throughout the summer. So not only are we banding these birds, we're implementing field work to be able to monitor them, keep tabs on them, see are their uh, nests successful, are their eggs hatching, how are they doing as parents basically. And this is a, a good example of seeing those bands. So we do have some really good photographers in the area that will send us these pictures and say, hey, I saw this bird on Saranac Lake, and I know for sure that it was here at this day at this time, and that gives us really good information to say, okay, yep, this bird was here, we know it was here, it had a mate this year, and it had this many chicks. So that's always a really great way to keep information about each individual. So loons are always going to make their nest right on the edge of the water because of how specialized their feet are to swimming. They're really great in the water, but on land they have a lot of trouble. So they have to have their nest right on the edge of the water. And loons are going to lay typically one to two eggs, very rarely three. And this could be mom or dad. Both male and female loons play equal parental roles taking care of chicks. So both of them are incubating, both of them are feeding chicks and having them right on their back. So After an egg is laid, its incubation period is typically exactly 27 days, give or take. Um, and the eggs that are laid are laid asynchronously. So that means one egg is laid first and then another a little while later, usually within the same day. Um, so you tend to see an older sibling and a younger sibling, which can be a problem. Sometimes an older sibling can beat up the younger one, um, and the parents don't seem to really mitigate this fighting. They just kind of let nature take its course with that. And this is a fledgling at 11 weeks, so one that's in its juvenile plumage. And you can see, I think he's just about begging for food still. <laughs> So one of the things we're really interested in is chick survival rate. Chicks have it really, really tough. Um, not only are they really small and vulnerable to a lot of predators and um, any changes in the environment, but once they have grown to be juveniles, they have a long trip ahead of them for migration, and their parents don't take them. They go by themselves. So the first loons that are going to be leaving the Adirondacks in the winter are our adults. Um, they know what's going on. The second the ice comes in, they're ready. They're heading to the coast. Um, but with our juveniles, they're not so set to leave immediately. So they can be a bit of an issue with ice in um, and not knowing when to go. But I will get a little bit more into that later. So we're also looking at a full profile of mercury in the area. We're not just looking at how much is in our loons. We're also testing crayfish, fish, the water itself um, to try and get a good full picture of the mercury that's in our water systems. So you can see we start down here at water with a really, really low amount of mercury in it. It's not seemingly affecting anything. But as you build up the uh, food chain and you start to get to our top predators here, the loons, you can see how much of a difference it is that they've built up and accumulated these toxins. And then again, this just shows uh, the difference between male and female. So you've got males up here on the top with that high and extra high risk being much larger than the females. And that's, again, because the females can lay eggs and get rid of a little bit of those toxins, but the males don't have a way to get rid of any of the toxins, aside from molting their feathers, but it's not a whole lot. So then when comparing low mercury birds to high mercury birds, we're seeing how productive they are. 
So the green bars here are your low mercury, and the red is high mercury. And in each category, our higher mercury birds are doing less or less productive at nesting, hatching, chick survival, and overall production. So then thinking about how this relates to lake acidity, as our lake's acidity, as it gets more acidic, um, that increases the ability for mercury to get into the water system. Oh, sorry. So the more acidic a lake is, the more mercury it's able to take on, basically. Um, so you can see that's shown here that in lower pH systems, we've got a higher amount of mercury um, than less acidic systems. And it seems like the highest concentration of mercury and our highest mercury risk is in this area of the park. We're thinking that that has to do with the Great Lakes and lake effect, that they must be getting a lot more rain and a lot more of that um, deposition there before it carries over into the rest of the park. And then thinking about it um, it's in terms of on a timeline, our mercury levels seem to have level off from 2010 to present day, mercury seems to have flattened, flattened out. Um, it's looking like it's starting to decrease now in our more recent studies, but with our loons, it's also flattening out. They're not decreasing in mercury as the lakes are decreasing in mercury, but it is a positive that they're not increasing anymore. And then looking at one individual lake over time, we can see that there was a trend where the mercury decreased over time. So from the late 1800s to mid uh, 2000s. And this is one of those birds that's in an in-between being a chick and a juvenile. So he's got some funny plumage there. And um, really our, our organization is trying to get as much information about the mercury in our birds and how it's affecting our birds as possible. And we're publishing this information in uh, these different publications that I have listed here. And then we'll translate those into a more public, digestible reading as opposed to the really science-heavy articles that we're releasing. So these are a little bit more public friendly. And I have copies of these if anyone is interested. So what does studying loon migration look like? Uh, our loons are not necessarily getting their tan when they're migrating. It says, spend winter shoveling snow in below zero temperatures. I'm a loon, but I'm not crazy. So. Being in the Adirondacks in the winter is a challenge. It would be a challenge for loons if they stayed with us because in order to get their fish, they'd have to go through two to three feet of snow and ice. Um, so all of our lakes in the Adirondacks are too shallow, they'll freeze over in the window, winter typically, so that's going to send all of our loons out. Usually the adults, as soon as the ice starts to come in, that's a big sign to them to head out and migrate to the coast. Yeah? Yeah, so I'll, I'll um, show you some more maps in a second, but all of our Adirondack loons are typically going to go to the Atlantic coast. Um, they'll beeline it as quick to the Atlantic as they can, usually anywhere from Cape Cod to Jersey Shore. Um, though we have had some outliers that go further south to places like Florida, but that's not very typical for our, the Adirondack loons in general. So one, sorry, one of the issues that they face when they're migrating, um, there's a lot of problems they run into. One is that we have issues with oil spills on the coast, and because they happen on the coast, and then our birds are coming back up into New York State, there's nowhere in place to help those birds in between there, basically. So there's oil spill recovery and uh, rehab happening on the coastline, but because we're not having oil spills in the Adirondacks, there aren't those resources uh, in place for our birds once they do reach us. Um, another issue is botulism in the Great Lakes. There's a lot, a lot of migratory birds that will stop down in the Great Lakes and um, end up having issues with botulism. And then just commercial fishing bycatch, especially on the coastline. There's a lot of 
loons that will get stuck in gill nets, um, and it's not like the fishermen are intending for this to happen, it's just... So, one way that we have tried to study loons that are migrating is through satellite transmitters. Um, it's a pretty, I don't want to say like invasive surgery, it's a, you can see this is the transmitter. And it just goes right underneath the skin on the back of the bird, and it'll stick up like this. They're a little remote control loon. Uh, and this satellite will basically send a signal to us uh, telling us the bird's location, um, and it's hooked up so that if anything happens, it gives us a signal to let us know if the bird has passed away or there's something wrong with the signal. So this shows some of the movements that we tracked of our loons from the Adirondacks and in other places. So, you can see that from November 14th here, we had a bird that traveled down, ended up November 16th on the coast, and then they typically will swim down further south. They'll hit the coast as quick as they can and then kind of find a territory as they move south. And then they return typically to the same lake each summer. Um, only if there's a territorial fight or a new guy in town do they tend to switch and have musical chairs happen on their lakes. We also were able to have um, a juvenile that we put a tracker on. He just happened to be large enough and uh, strong enough for us to be able to feel confident to put a tracker on him. So that was really exciting because we got to have, uh, we got to get some data on a juvenile migrating for the first time versus adults that have been doing it year after year and have gotten it down. So you can see, oh, it's not bright enough, but you, there's a yellow line that passes right through here. That's our adult migration travel. And you can see it's a pretty straight line. They know where they're going, they've, they've got it figured out, and they get there really quickly. Um, you can see this bird got there on November 16th, whereas the juvenile uh, left December 4th, got here, December 15th, ting down here, and then the 12th of January finally got to the coast. Um, so they really do take their time. They'll go lake to lake, um, and they'll bop around a lot. And we think that this is a learned behavior, that loons aren't born knowing, ah, I'm going to the coast today, that it's something that they have to learn and that they have to um, really get some landmarks along the way to be able to come back again later. So this is, if you've never seen a loon flying before, um, you're never going to see a loon that's soaring or gliding very majestically because they're such heavy big birds, they have to be constantly flapping in order to keep themselves up. So migration is pretty tough on them, they're really going full speed and um, using a lot of energy to be able to get there. And this is another one of our loons, a uh, female that we had tracked and luckily enough while she was flying she actually had some points that sent to us um, while she was in the air so we got to get a little bit more information about where she traveled and how she got there and then this is her on her way back up and this is her two days later so if we're not using a satellite uh, transmitter because they are, we require to have a surgery for the loon, it's a really invasive procedure, um, and it costs a lot of money, and there's a lot that can go wrong with it. It's really stressful and expensive, so we don't utilize it very, very much. Um, another option we have are geolocators. The problem with these is that they're not sending a signal every day or even at all. The only way that we can get the information from these geolocators about where our bird has been is if we can recapture that bird and in the right amount of time. So um, I believe the ones we've used prior have had a life of a year to two years. And if you don't get that locator back in those years, everything on it is just dead, just gone. So they're a little stressful as well. <laughs> so this is a map that shows our annual moon census, which is another program in our organization. Every summer we pick one day of the year. It's usually the last weekend of July. 
Um, and we set an hour, usually from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., for people to go out on their lakes and give a survey of what loons they saw that day. Um, this is really great to give us an estimate of how many loons are in the park. Right now, we're at somewhere around 1,000 loons um, in the blue line itself. And we are looking for information outside of the blue line as well. So it would be really great to get some data points from the bigger lakes. And I know a lot of you guys might be from around the area, so definitely talk to me if you're interested in that. We're also monitoring their nesting success, and one of the new ways we've been doing that is with nest cameras. We're hoping to have a live footage camera that you guys would be able to go online and see the nest. Um, that's something we're hoping to get running in the next couple of years, but for now we have stop motion cameras. Um, so anytime something moves in front of the camera, we're going to get a clip of it. Um, and it's led to a lot of new findings for us, particularly like this one, you can see this loon has three eggs in the nest. Um, so we were able to confirm and keep track of eggs and watch them closely. So that's a pretty rare occurrence that we might not have noticed if we hadn't had the cameras out. And then we also just get to see how they interact with other animals. This is a beaver down here, and you can see the loon doesn't really seem to mind him at all. Um, they don't really mind other waterfowl as long as they don't get too close to the nest or get too nosy. See, there's one of the chicks down here, and then mom or dad in the nest up there. We also found last year from one of our trail cameras that we had quite a few black bear run-ins at our loon nest. We had at least two or three nests that were predated on by black bears last year. And the only way we know that is because we have these pictures, and you can see the loon tried to stand her ground for a little while, but not much you're going to win a fight with a black bear, so she moved off. And this was our other nest. You can see the two eggs down there, and within the next minute, both of those eggs were gone. And you hate to see it, because it's hardly even a snack for a bear like this, but everybody's got to eat. One of the other issues we run into with nesting is water level rise. So because of loons nesting right on the water's edge um, to be able to have access easily to their nest, any type of increase rainfall is going to be a big problem and so as we're seeing changes with climate change and wetter springs in the Adirondacks that's becoming a real problem. So this is just before and after picture to give you an idea. We also saw quite a bit of human disturbance with our trail cameras. Um, a lot of times if don't have a nest that's marked as a nest. People are either ignorant about it or they want to get a really great photo so they'll get really, really close. Um, and this is obviously stressful for the bird. Um, so we're trying to mitigate that. And once we saw that this was happening from our trail cameras, we were able to put out signs saying, keep your distance, please be respectful of balloons nesting area, give them space. Another thing that we've had issue with in the past with our loons is fishing line entanglement. Um, it started off as just every once in a while we'd have a bird that would come in that would have fishing entanglement and it became much, much more frequent over the past few years. So depending on how it gets wrapped around them, if they can't eat food, that's really going to be a big problem for them, so we need to get it removed as quickly as possible. Um, best case scenario, we can get them in the boat and get them back out into the water really quickly, um, but there have been cases where we've had to take them uh, more into a rescue situation. So luckily, the director of our organization is a wildlife rehabilitator and um, a retired veterinarian, so she has a lot of skills for us to be able to um, take in some of these birds. And then the other pictures you're seeing here are of ice stand loons. So I had mentioned before the juveniles sometimes will have issue. They don't leave early enough, and then they end up getting iced in. Um, and we'll, we have a lot of people in the area who keep an eye out on lakes, and we get calls all the time from concerned folks that want to make sure that the loons are getting out OK. So um, I believe we had two or three instances this year of ice in, but I think all of the birds were able to get out of the water themselves and into the air, so very good. We've also started to implement a fishing line recycling program to try and reduce all the issues with um, fishing line entanglement that you just saw those nasty pictures of. 
So the bin that's on the right there is our recycling container. We've got about 100 of those in our basement right now at the center, and we're looking to implement those and put them out on different lakes uh, throughout the park. We're hoping to start a program uh, assigning people as stewards of these so that they can maintain them on their own um, and we don't have to be concerned about it in years later. We also have boat launch signs and do presentations and newsletters for outreach and we're trying to increase um, just letting people know what we're doing and what we're about and getting them into the center and learning about loons and caring about them. So what can you do when you're in the Adirondacks to help out the loons? On the water specifically, uh, using non-lead fishing gear is really important. Collecting all of your fishing line and discarding it properly, as well as just respecting the loons in their habitat and in their home. Uh, making sure that you're keeping a safe distance and especially if a loon has chicks or a nest that you're not getting into their space. And then on land, um, reducing reusing, recycling, and conserving energy are big ways that you can help just in your everyday life to uh, improve our conditions for our lives. This is a video, but it looks like it's not going to play for me, that's okay. So because we're a nonprofit organization, the majority of our support is coming through grants and donations. Uh, so this is just a list of some of the donors and grants that we have partnered with throughout the years. Um, we also get quite a bit of in-kind support in the area. and It's really amazing to see from all over the country and all over the world people who will donate to us, even though we, I think I take for granted that I live in the Adirondacks and I get to experience the loons so frequently. And um, it's really nice to see that from all over we have support from people. And then I just want to let you know that we do have our center as well. And we've, um, although we've been focused on research in the past, we do have the center now as a physical place for people to come and learn more about loons. We have exhibits there, trying to make it um, sort of a museum quality place. And we also have a storefront there. So if there's any loon item that you would be looking to purchase, we definitely have it. <laughs> loon, everything you can think of there. So you're definitely more than welcome to come visit me. And that's all that I have for you guys. So if there's any questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there was specifically a winter plumage picture in here. The best I think I can do is to show you plumage of juveniles because that's a as close as I can get at this presentation, because it doesn't seem like I have any winter moons. Uh, but I know it is. Yeah, and right. And very frequently um, in the winter, if you're on the coast, you'll probably see loons and not even realize it because you're so used to that black and white patterning. Um, and then once you're not looking for it, you don't even recognize them. Yes. Two questions. One is. Ah, yes. Do you want me to start with that first question? Yes. Yeah, so typically the chicks will get their juvenile plumage, which you've seen, um, at about 7 to 11 weeks, I believe. And then um, once they've gotten their juvenile plumage, the chicks who are born, let's say, this summer, and then have migrated into the fall and into the winter onto the coast, those chicks will actually stay on the coast for two to three years before coming back to the Adirondacks. So, sort of similar to eagles and other birds that have a juvenile stage that lasts a couple of years, that's what our loons are going through. Um, so not only do our chicks from this summer have to go by themselves to the coast, they have to wait two to three years, have their teenage years out on the coast, and then once they've grown up and matured, they have to find their way back years later. And they manage to do it. But we know that they come back to the Adirondacks in general can't say for certain that they go to the exact lake they were born on, but we do know they come back to the area. So when they come back to the lakes, normally they're in their adult plumage. Yes, yes. Yep. The reason, reason I ask, I, I have a family on a lake in Massachusetts, and I, one summer I watched a loon that had juvenile plumage the whole summer. Mm -hmm. And then um, it disappeared in the fall. I guess you saw it losing feathers in the fall, and then it disappeared. And then the next summer, I don't know if it was the same loon or not, 
Yeah, I would say so. The other question I get is about uh, platforms for guests. Um, there's some talk on this yes. delay about because, you know, uh, providing platforms. What do you think about those? Right. Um, so right now in the Adirondacks with our number of about a thousand individual loons in the area, that we're thinking is pretty much at their carrying capacity. Um, so we could put out rafts um, and platforms for nesting because those are a really great way to get rid of that risk of flooding. They can move up and down with the water fluctuation and it's not as big of a problem. The other thing is only some loons will use them. Some of our loons that, because we do have rafts on a few lakes, some of our loons use them, but others it's like it's too man-made, they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, but I know there are some states that are using them because they really are trying to increase their numbers of loons. And right now for us, we're just at like a maintenance level. Any other questions? Yep. Um, the eyes, I've heard the eyes only turn red during breeding season. Yes, um, that is true. So similar to when their plumage is changing in the winter and it's gonna look more dull and like a juvenile, their eyes also will dull in the winter. And there's a couple, um, it's kind of a debate between a few people in the scientific community about why the women's eyes are red. Uh, for the most part, it's believed it's just to look pretty for um, breeding plumage. It's something that's signaling that you're a good mate. Um, but other people have argued that they think there's some reason that red eyes helps them see fish underwater more easily. Um, there's something about having the color red that underneath the water helps them, but for the most part, the studies I've seen lean way more into saying it's a breeding plumage characteristic. Is it only the males, or do they both males and females? Have both males and females will have the red eyes, and both males and females are going to have um, the same breeding plumage. Let me see if I can find a good. Um, so all of the coloration that you're seeing, the collar that they have, um, the necklace that they have, and then just the patterning on their back is going to be the same for males and females. Um, so you can't tell them apart that way. Um, the best shot you have of telling a male loon from a female loon is by looking at a mated pair. If you're looking at an individual, it's going to be pretty much impossible. But if you're looking at a mated pair, the male is going to be a little bit larger. Um, and then also if you hear one yodel, you know that the yodel is only from the male. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the territoriality of them? Do they hang out at the same lakes year after year after year, the same ones? Right, yeah. So what we've seen is that usually loons prefer to go to the same lake every year. They like to have the same nesting site. Uh, they don't like to build new nesting sites and they're really, really protective of those sites. So once they've got an established um, nesting ground, they're really territorial about it. But again, a new, a new stronger male might come in and kick you out of that space. Um, but, it, sorry, what was your first question to that? Typically, yes. Yep. Um, and then once, So in their in their territorial fights, they because they can they are fighting a lot in the summer, but it's really just because of that nesting site. So other times of the year, you'll see loons together, especially in the fall before migrating. You can see really really large groups of loons together, and they are social birds. They do like to socialize, um, but just once they have their nest and their chicks, they full shot go on to taking care of chicks and being protector and everything else doesn't matter, it seems. Yep. Um, I can hear you say, but um, I was told that for migration, that loons will congregate in a specific spot and then move from there. Yes. Um, so loons aren't going to be migrating together the way that you think of geese and those big V formations that's like a mob of them go across the sky. Loons, it's usually just individuals or pairs that will go by at a time. Um, but when they are migrating beforehand, they will all move up together. 
So it's kind of strange. It's like they have one last hurrah before heading out, and then they all go their separate ways. Um, so we do see, especially on, it seems, Lake Clear in the Adirondacks, for the past couple of years, that's been like the hot spot, last lake to go to before migration. And I, we think it's because it's like their version of a public lake. None of the loons have nested on it in a couple of years, so it's like free territory for everybody. And they all kind of get together and they'll do these really bizarre like dances with each other. They're very strange to see interact with one another. They're really, they really are very social once their chicks are grown up. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll have like a big old party. We call them cocktail parties in the fall. And then they head out. <laughs> Any other questions? About population sense. Size. In, in the entire Adirondack. Right. I don't know if we. Do you have such data? We do, but I don't know if we've published it. We have quite a bit of data that's um, not published so far. There's only select parts of the data that we have that we have published. Um, but I can talk to you after a bit more about that if you're interested. Other questions? Yes. So the loons don't care if it's freshwater or salt water? They don't, it seems. Um, they do have a gland in their bill that excretes salt, so sometimes when they're on the coast or in salt water, you'll see it looks kind of like they have a runny nose, they're kind of gross looking. Um, but it's really just getting rid of all that excess salt. And they seem to have no issue going from salt water to fresh water. We do see a preference of salt water in the winter time. It's like it's ingrained to them, go to the coast for the winter and then fresh water for breeding season. We think that that's because fresh water is a little less harsh on their system, so when they're putting all their energy into reproduction and their chicks, it's a little easier of an area to be in than when they're on the coast. Um, but people debate back and forth whether loons are considered seabirds or freshwater birds, because depending on where you're from, you're going to argue one way or the other. <laughs> Oh, just in one of the videos yeah. there's a vocalization? I think it might be this. Let's see. I'm going to do a slide. See me afterwards, and I'll see if I can figure out what that sound is for you. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you again so much for having.